This is Phil Kopman with a tutorial on modal systems and state charts. It's common for embedded system software to be state intensive rather than flow control intensive. State intensive systems should be designed with a formalism other than flow charts. When you need to do detailed design of state intensive behaviors, use a state chart. State intensive behaviors include different operating modes, such as start, stop, run, or inputs that drive sequences of events over time. A state chart is a software implementation of a finite state machine. We'll get into details in a bit, but the figure in the upper right is a simplified state chart that has different operational modes. In a state chart, the system is in one state, one bubble at a time, and moves between bubbles. You can see here that the standby state is currently active, denoted by the color yellow. Then the system transitions on an arc to the engage state, then transitions on a different arc to the run state. Anti-patterns for state-intensive systems include that there is no detailed design, just the code. As we'll see, implementing state-intensive systems using the wrong coding style can get really messy. Another anti-pattern is deeply nested if statements instead of switch statements for stateful code. The third anti-pattern is mixing mode change logic with normal output sequences. Here is some example code for a three-speed desk fan. Think about drawing a flowchart from this code and whether reading the code or drawing the flowchart will really lead to deep understanding of the code behavior. Sure, it's only a few lines of code. You can figure it out if you apply yourself, but it's going to take some effort. Importantly, it's going to be difficult to find out if there are any bugs in this code. Is there any behavior that's a problem? When you press the Change button or the On Off button, what happens next? To understand this, you have to dissect the code and get it all in your head at the same time. That's a recipe for bugs and difficult to understand code. State charts are a better approach. A state chart is the software version of a finite state machine, which is a formalism commonly used in hardware design. A state chart contains a set of states with side effects. That means that each bubble in a state chart is a state that either the system is in or not in. Any side effect is something that that state does as a result of being in the state. For example, setting an output to something or setting a variable to a particular value. The system moves from state to state along transition arrows that have guard conditions. The arrow is activated when the guard is true and if the guard is false, the arrow is not taken. If no guard conditions are true on any arrow in a state, the system stays in that state until a guard condition becomes true. There are some types of finite state machines that permit side effects on the arrows, but we're going to avoid those because we found in practice it leads to messy code that is more difficult to understand. There also has to be an initial state that defines which state the system is in when the system is reset or the power is turned on. Any system you're going to create using state charts can be described by a set of states with side effects, transitions with guards, and an initial system reset. To give you an idea of how state charts work, we'll build up an example for a desk fan that corresponds to the code we just showed you on the previous slide. We'll do this by first defining a state for each fan speed, it's a three-speed fan, so there'll be four states, one for each speed plus the off state. We'll define the transitions, and then we'll ask, is it easier to understand the state chart than that code we showed you, and which one is easier to find bugs in? We're going to do two examples, a simple one and then a slightly more complicated one. The simple one is for a single-button desktop fan. It has one button, a change speed button, and the output of the finite state machine sets the speed of the fan to off, slow, medium, or fast. To create a finite state machine, the first thing we do is define the states. We know that this fan has four states, so we'll define four bubbles, off, slow, medium, and fast. 
and give each one a unique number for traceability that can be useful later. That means our states are S1 off, S2 slow, S3 medium, and S4 fast. Every finite state machine needs a system reset arc, so let's put that in now so we don't forget. We've decided that when the power turns on, the fan should power up in the off state. Next, we apply side effects. S1 off, well, the speed is the output, and the speed should be set to a value for stop. When we get to the code, we'll find out stop is some numeric constant value. With the other states, we also need to set the speed in each state, and it will be no surprise that for slow, we want the speed to be slow, medium, the speed is mead, and for fast, the speed is fast. The fact that the state names look a lot like the side effect is because we chose the names that way. There's no inherent relationship between the state name and the side effect in terms of the words used. Next, we have to define some transitions. The first transition is if the fan's off and you want to turn it on, you press the change button once. And we've decided in this fan that pressing the change button from off moves the fan to slow speed. There are some fans that go from off immediately to high speed. We could have done that, and that's a design decision. But in this case, we decided to cycle the fan from off to slow, and then from slow to medium, medium to fast, and finally from fast to off. The implication is it takes four button presses to cycle through all the speeds. So pressing the button from off once is slow, press it again to get to medium, press it a third time for fast, press it a fourth time for off. You might have encountered ceiling fans with pull chains that operate more or less this way. Okay, so this works, but it's kind of inconvenient because of the fans at slow, you have to press the th button three times to turn the fan off. Maybe customers would like to have a fan that you can turn off no matter what, but that will require a second button. We'll take a look at that type of design next. Now let's take a look at a somewhat more complicated fan design that uses the same four states, but has two buttons to modify the fan's current speed. There's a change button, which cycles through speeds, and there's an on-off button, which can turn the fan on if it's off, but can also turn the fan off no matter what speed it's in without cycling through the other speeds. As before, the output is a fan speed. At the beginning, the procedure is the same. We define four states because the fan has four different states it can be in, off, slow, medium, fast. We toss in a system reset, and we identify the side effects. So far, no different from the simple fan. But now we have two buttons to work with. If the fan is off, you can press either button to turn it on, which kind of makes sense because somebody wants the fan on, they'll just press a button and see what happens. We've decided in this case that both buttons will put the fan into slow speed. So far, feels the same as the previous design. And pressing the change button cycles from slow to medium to fast as before. But here's a twist. When you're in fast speed, instead of the change button turning the fan off, the change button goes to slow speed. That means that once the fan is operating, the change button cycles through slow, medium, and fast, then back to slow, and never turns the fan off. Well, how do you get the fan off? That's what the on-off button is for. The on-off button from the fast speed is what you use to turn the fan off. But you don't really want to have to change speed to fast before you can turn it off, so the on-off button also has guard conditions from all the fan motion states back to off. Summing up, pressing any button turns the fan on, the change button cycles through the three speeds, and whenever the fan is running, pressing the on-off button will turn it back off. As with the previous design, there are different ways to do this. You could have, instead of going slow through fast, gone fast through slow, and so on. But the idea is this date chart shows you an unambiguous definition of what the buttons do, how they do it, and it's relatively straightforward to look at the picture and understand what the system is intended to do. Let's look at some code to implement the state chart we just saw with the two button fan. In any state chart, there has to be a variable keeping the current state, cur state. And in this case, we've defined it as an enum that can be off, slow, medium, or fast. That means the system knows which state it's in simply based on the cur state variable. We want to identify constants that allow the speed to be set to values that mean something in the code instead of using magic numbers. 
So we've defined four constants for off, slow, medium, and fast. And those numbers are arbitrary. They could be changed. If fast is 25 on one model or fast is 30 on another model, the rest of the code remains the same. We initialize current state to off. That corresponds to the reset arc. And note that we're able to use the name of the state so it's more obvious what's happening in the code. There's a procedure, process states, which periodically runs from the main loop. So for example, it might run 10 times per second and processes this state machine. In general, every state machine will have a subroutine like this to process its states. And all the state machines are run periodically in part of the main loop of the software. The code switches on current state, which jumps it to the part of the code that deals with the state the system is currently in. And you can see case off is you're in the off state. And notice the comment, state S1. The reason we have a number is it makes it easy to look at it and say, oh yeah, this is the off state. And yes, we meant state one. There's no chance for mistake here. The first line does the side effect. It says, set the speed to speed off. Then the code looks at the arc guards and decides which guards are true. If speed button is true or on off button is true, then the current state is slow. That line of code tests the guard conditions on the output arc from off and sets cur state to a new state. The net result is if that arc is true, then the state will change for the next time the code runs. The break is the end of handling this particular state and you're done until the next time the process states function is called. Now we march down all the states and do pretty much the same thing. For the state slow, which is S2, we say, well, the side effect is speed slow. So you run the side effect. And in this case, there are two output arcs. So there's two if statements. The first if statement is if the speed button is true, then set the current state to medium. The second if statement is if the on off button is true, then set the current state to off. The pattern here is that first you do the side effect and then each outgoing arrow has an if statement that changes the state if the guard is true. Continuing with the code, if you're in state S3, which is medium speed, the side effect of actually setting the speed to medium is performed. And then the two outgoing arcs are checked to see if you stay in the same state, which is none of them are true, or you move to the fast state if the speed button has been pressed, or you move to the off state if the on off button has been pressed. The last case handles fast speed. And again, you take the side effect, change the two arcs, and the fan turns off if the on-off button has been pressed. Finally, there's a cleanup default state that throws an error because all the cases should have been handled and this line of code should never execute. Back at a high level, we have a finished state chart with states and transitions and a reset. It has inputs of change speed and on-off. It has an output of speed that could be stop, slow, medium, or fast and it has state names corresponding to the states of off, slow, medium, and fast. The system reset is to state one. As an exercise, I recommend you take this picture, compare it to the code, and make sure that there's nothing in the picture missing from the code and nothing in the code missing from the picture. What you'll find is the organization of the code makes it quite straightforward to do a peer review because you look at the code, you look at the state chart, and in practice, you'll find out it's pretty hard to get it wrong. And if you got it wrong, it's really easy to find out that there's a problem just by comparing the code to the state chart. That means instead of having to look at messy code and figure out what it does, you can look at the state chart, convince yourself the state chart is what you want, and then almost mechanically take a look at the code and make sure the code matches. In fact, there are tools that will do the code generation automatically, but it's worthwhile to do this as a human-driven exercise to understand the correspondence between the code and the state chart. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of a flow chart and a state chart. On the left is a flow chart from a textbook for a half duplex serial port that's using software flow control X on X off. If you're not familiar with this type of system, it's okay to skip to the next slide. But for those of you who have dealt with serial port flow control, you'll recall there's a flag that tells you if there's a byte ready to read. There's another flag telling you if it's okay to write a byte and you'll have some sort of buffers of incoming and outgoing messages. 
The code on the left is a flowchart that, as far as I can tell, correctly implements Exxon and Exoff, but it took me a while to work through it and see what was really going on there. On the right is a state chart I created to try and correspond to what was going on in the software. Here, there's an initial state of the transceiver is idle in state one. If an incoming byte is received, it goes to state two. And if it's an X off, it goes to state four. Otherwise, it goes back to state one with an implicit side effect that the byte that's been read has been left in a read buffer. We're back in state one. And if there's no incoming read byte, but the outgoing write buffer is empty, then you write a byte and again, go back to state one. The right-hand side of the state chart deals with flow control saying it's okay to write. In other words, it's the Exxon state. The left side of the state machine has a receive idle, so state four, which corresponds to state one. But in state four, you've been told not to write anything. You've received an Exxon. And so it just reads bytes until it gets an Exxon command. And when it receives an Exxon command, it goes back to state one. It's a bit more straightforward to tell that this correctly implements the Exxon Exxon protocol. And it's also most straightforward to tell that reads have priority over writes in this situation. As an exercise, you should look at the flowchart on the left and see if it actually does the same thing that the state chart says. Then ask yourself, if it was your job to make sure the system was defect free, would you rather be looking at that flowchart or would you rather be looking at that state chart? There are a number of best practices for state charts. First and foremost, if your system has a stateful behavior, then you should be using state charts and not flowcharts. In my experience, it's very common for embedded systems to have mostly stateful behavior. You press a button or some input comes and the system changes its behavior until the next input comes. That just screams state chart, not flowchart. State charts have an advantage that they map to an easier to test and easier to review switch statement, which is generally a lot easier to understand and get right than a bunch of nested ifs that you can get from a flowchart. I recommend that you avoid putting actions on arcs to simplify the code. Yes, there are state machines that have actions on arcs, but what we found is they lead to increased bugs in the code and in the design. You should also keep your code complexity under control. For example, by moving complex behaviors inside a state out to a subroutine helper function so that cyclomatic complexity primarily comes from the switch statement and not from a bunch of spaghetti code buried into the individual cases. There are some pitfalls for state charts. If the code really is a bunch of logic functions based on what's going on right now instead of trying to recreate history with if statements, then you might be better off with a flowchart. Some computations are step one, step two, step three. That's what flowcharts are about. But if you see a flowchart going out, querying variables to figure out, okay, where are we again? That should be a state chart. Don't let your state charts get too complex. Once you have so many states they won't fit on a single sheet of letter paper, you might need to break the state chart up into pieces or otherwise decompose the complexity just so you can understand it. If you look up tutorials on state charts that go at greater length, you'll find out that they have nested state charts, they have parallel state machines. There's quite a rich set of notation that will let you break big state charts into little state charts that are easy to understand and more importantly, easy to get right.